Welcome to Google Cloud On Air, live webinars from Google Cloud. We are hosting webinars every Tuesday. My name is Ryan McDowell. And my name is Ahmed Altai. Today, we're going to be talking about stream processing with Cloud Dataflow. You can ask questions anytime on the platform, and we have Googlers on the standby ready to answer them. Let's get started. Today, we're going to talk through stream processing, common patterns with Dataflow, the state and timer APIs and how to take advantage of them, as well as streaming with the Python SDK. Before we dive straight into patterns, it's important to understand why streaming matters and how Apache Beam and Dataflow help you address some of the common problems within stream processing. So we can have data that we're processing. And that data can be big. For instance, we could process gigabytes to terabytes of data. And that data could be really, really big. For instance, we may want to process huge amounts of data per day and have many days to process. That data could also be infinitely big. So you can be streaming data, and it's constantly coming, and it never stops. This gives you a problem with processing, especially when accounting for unknown delays within your data. So one of the more difficulties with unbounded data is unknown delays. Assuming that every record has an embedded timestamp, hopefully we would see the record show up into our system shortly after the event time. Here's a record which happened at 8 AM and showed up in the system shortly after. Then we see this yellow record that was slightly delayed by a little bit. And then finally, we see this green record on the right-hand side, which is uh, significantly delayed. It had an event timestamp of 8 AM, but didn't show up into our system until 2 PM. There's many examples why this may happen. So for example, imagine a mobile phone. You maybe get on into an airplane, turn on airplane mode, be playing your game the entire time, generating these game events. And then when you get off the plane, you turn off airplane mode. Then all the events at that time shoot up to the cloud and enter your pipeline. So even though the events had occurred much earlier, they actually showed up into your pipeline much later than expected. So the mobile world introduces this delay in a pretty big way. If you're performing element-wise transforms, for instance, filtering for the yellow messages, that's easy. It's just a continuous transform. In this case, we don't care about time. We're not doing any grouping or aggregation. In this case, we don't care that it's even an unbounded data set. Executing transforms in processing time will be just fine. But what happens when we want to do an aggregation? We may want to see the count of events per user. For batch, that's easy because the data is bounded. And essentially, we read in the input and until we run out of input, and then we emit the count. For streaming, you can't do that. You never run out of the, the data, so you can't say, we're done processing, and here's the count that I've seen. Most commonly, what people want to do is windowing. So divide up the data into some chunks, emit the count for uh, that particular chunk. An initial approach to doing this would be uh, using processing time windows. So for instance, uh, when a record or a job shows up into or a record shows up into our job, look at the wall clock, uh, do that for a minute, and then say, here is the count for that minute. There's many use cases where that is fine, but if you care about the timestamp within your records, you may not get the grouping you actually want. What we really may want to do is group by the event time within our data. Instead of viewing time as something on the wall, uh, view it as a data stream. Group by the event timestamps and output them as we see them. This allows us to perform calculations over that time interval in which the events occurred. So for example here, taking the events of when they occurred in processing time, and then shuffling them and regrouping them into event time windows. This allows us to group data uh, by event time, which will be semantically uh, more meaningful to our analytics. So I mentioned windowing. What is a window? All a window is is a function to divide data into time chunks. Within the Apache Beam SDK, which runs on Dataflow, we provide several different window types which allow you to slice and dice your data in different ways. These are some of the more common ones. So you have fixed windows. So you can think of a fixed window as dividing up data into fixed periods of time. So let's say 12 to 1, 1 to 2. And then as soon as you reach the uh, end of that window, compute your aggregation, and output account for that window. 
You also have sliding windows, and these are sort of like windows, uh, fixed windows that overlap. So for instance, uh, an element could end up in many windows. So say you have an hour window that slides by every minute. You may have a window that's uh, 1201 to 101, uh, 1202 to 102, so on and so forth. And this is useful for detecting uh, anomalies on the incoming data. So for instance, determining how many of a, uh, a record of a given type showed up in our pipeline within the past 10 minutes. But what if we wanted to do data dependent windowing? So not look at our data in terms of uh, time, but look at it in terms of uh, something that is meaningful within our data, such as uh, doing different windows for every user. This is what we would call sessions. Um, here, every key is a different window. And sessions are defined by whenever there's a burst of activity, we're going to capture that burst of activity. And then as soon as there's a gap in, uh, in that activity, we'll basically close that window and then emit it downstream for processing so that we can calculate statistics over that window. This is a common thing that you may want to do in analytics, and it's supported out of the box within the Apache Beam SDK and Cloud Dataflow. So we talked about windowing, and we talked about semantically how we would divide our data up uh, in computer calculations. But when does the answer come out? Um, this is problematic because you have to know when to admit uh, the answer. And this is what we use triggers for. So by default, what we have is something called a watermark. The watermark tries to know uh, everything about our data for a particular window and to know when we are done with that. So if the watermark says 12 o'clock, it means to the best of our knowledge, there is no data earlier left than uh, earlier than 12 o'clock. And then we can calculate the, and emit the on-time result. For external sources, it has to be somewhat heuristic. So for instance, PubSub, we can actually do a read ahead of the buffer to ensure there's no data left in it uh, before 12 o'clock, before we actually emit that. But if there's a mobile phone on a plane and it has data for 11 o'clock in it, um, clearly they don't have uh, any connectivity. We cannot know about that data that's on their phone. So there has to be some degree of heuristic to it. It can't be perfect. Just that, to the best of our knowledge, we can output a final count and emit the results. Here's an animated GIF with the watermark shown as a dotted line. The y-axis is processing time, and the x-axis is event time. The perfect watermark will know about everything that we haven't seen. Perfect watermark actually sees the future, so it can capture data that shows up significantly later than we anticipated. For the realistic watermark, we can see that it's pretty good but this one element, this nine, showed, that showed up significantly later, we didn't catch it because we had closed the window since we were, thought we were done processing data for that time period. So what happens when you have late data? How do you handle it? In the Apache Beam SDK, there's a way of saying, I want to process late data. You can add triggering to your window to indicate you want to process that late data. So for instance, there's a couple different ways of processing it. I can say I want to accumulate the processing, which means keep adding to, let's say, a sum or a count. So if I had, let's say, a, a, a count of 50 before, and two elements show up after the watermark, then they give me back a count of 52. I can also say discarding fired panes, which means give me a new sum since the last time I emitted a result. So if I saw 50 on time records and two elements showed up late after the watermark, then just give me back the two. This is another animation which shows uh, how we do things with speculative and late triggers. We can output tentative aggregations before the watermark is passed. And then even with the heuristic watermark, we're able to update it uh, and update the result and re-admit it downstream. So sort of saying, um, sorry, here's the actual data that I had for this time period. And this allows us to capture late data and also emit speculative data um, downstream to do our analytics. So now that we understand a little bit about how stream processing works, let's talk about common patterns within Dataflow. We'll start out with exactly once processing. So imagine that we're building a pipeline to ingest gaming events from our mobile game. Uh, we'll start building this pipeline from the most simple case. We want to ingest JSON data via PubSub, process it within Cloud Dataflow, and then output it to BigQuery. 
We're using PubSub here because it's a reliable, globally available message delivery service. Uh, and we expect our game to be popular worldwide. Now, if we're analyzing user behavior, duplicate data which enters our pipeline may throw off our analytics, which makes exactly once processing fairly critical. This is also critical in other industries. Uh, you can think of retail, where you may be processing transactions, or finance, in which you may be processing trades. Uh, having duplicate data enter your pipeline and then uh, computing on that duplicate data can throw off your analytics and skew um, uh, your data. So if we were to zoom into the PubSub portion of our architecture, we may presume that it may cause issues uh, with our system, given it's at least once delivery semantics. Here, the colors indicate unique keys of records. We can see that uh, on the right-hand side, we may receive duplicates in the subscriber, given the at least once delivery. Um, however, combining PubSub with Dataflow allows us to achieve exactly once processing out of the box with little effort. So how do we do that? Well, imagine that we have uh, these three messages here. Uh, this yellow message we're zooming in on, uh, you can see that it contains uh, uh, attributes and a payload. Uh, message attributes are essentially key value pairs that you can set on the header of a message. So you can think of setting a key value pair to do things like routing a, a message without having to deserialize it or reacting to duplicates within the pipeline. The message payload contains the serialized payload of the event. You'll see that we have a unique identifier here within the message payload in event ID. So the first step to actually processing this data in exactly once fashion, we're going to promote that event ID to the attributes. This allows us to instruct Dataflow to react to it within our pipeline. If we take a look at the code for our example game event pipeline, it may look like the following. We're applying the PubSub IO transform to read the data from our subscription and pass it to our transformations. Here, the transformations represent pardo functions. You can think of a pardo as a map in MapReduce. Essentially, take in an element, do some transformation on it, and then output the transformed element. In this case, when we're consuming from PubSub IO, we're just reading the messages from the subscription. So how do we start reacting to that event ID that we promoted to the attributes? Well, it's relatively simple. We just add in the dot with ID attribute field and pass in the key that we had put in our message attributes. This allows Dataflow to begin reacting to these messages and then automatically within the PubSub IO transform uh, be able to deduplicate those messages before sending them downstream within our pipeline. However, this will effectively deduplicate messages introduced by PubSub, so messages that are occurring as duplicates within our system. But there's also another case in which you may receive duplicates. So for instance, a producer publishes a message once, and then they publish it again, maybe let's say uh, several minutes later. This will also handle that case, but only within a 10 minute window. So for instance, if a uh, publisher published the message at minute one and then published the same message at minute three, we'll effectively deduplicate that. But we don't keep around the deduplication table forever. So if they were to publish across you know, multiple hours of timeframes, then we may want to introduce a unique transform to our pipeline. In this case, we don't anticipate that being the case. So uh, we can just deduplicate using the with ID attribute. So another common pattern in Dataflow is handling schema changes from the source system. For our mobile game example, imagine we have partners which publish events into our pipeline. There may be cases where those partners add an additional field to the schema which they are publishing. We don't want it to be dependent on those partners and have to coordinate releases. So we'll want to react to that dynamically within our streaming pipeline. Looking back at our messages, uh, on the left we see the schema which we expect, right? We have the same schema that we were processing before, but on the right-hand side in the green message, the partner has actually added an additional field. In this case, partner device IP. Now this additional field will call, cause the insert to fail. And this will cause us to either drop the message or continually failing on that message. Without accounting for this, the record uh, we'll never make it into our downstream system. So we'll have to think about how we handle this case. Well, there's a couple things within BigQuery and Dataflow that enable us to handle this with relative ease. So 
schema changes within BigQuery are additive within the same table, so you can add on fields um, within that table. And these changes happen online and require no downtime. So uh, there's no effect to downstream users if we were to submit an API call to add an additional column to our table based on the incoming data. And finally, the BigQuery sync within Dataflow allows for the retrieval of the failed inserts. So this allows us to submit records to BigQuery, then get back all the failures, and then react to them and do things like add an additional column to our output table. So zooming in on our pipeline code, we can easily handle changes by retrieving the failed inserts, uh, performing an update to the schema in real time, and then rewriting those out to BigQuery again. So uh, handling changes in this way enables us to uh, inspect each message for ch uh, schema changes, um, and then uh, output the additions to the BigQuery table. Now, we could have done this in a different way. We could have checked every single message to see if its schema had changed. But this would have been quite inefficient because we would be checking a bunch of messages that may not have changed schema. So you can imagine that maybe I'm processing data at uh, 1,000 records per second or a million records per second. Inspecting all those messages where they may not have changed schema will significantly slow down the pipeline. So doing it in this way allows us to only inspect and mutate the schema of those messages which fail insert and thus react to those schema changes that are happening upstream. So looking back at our pipeline now, we've simply added the, this additional path to process those errors, validate and mutate the schema, and then output to BigQuery. And this reduces the operational overhead of coordinating changes with our partners. We can automatically update our pipeline as changes occur. So we've added a lot of functionality to our pipeline thus far. Now we can utilize some of the windowing techniques mentioned earlier to perform our user analysis. Here we don't need to make any adjustments to our architecture since some of the strategies that we had mentioned earlier with windowing happen within Dataflow. Nothing needed to uh, add to the uh, architecture. So an example of uh, analysis that we may want to perform is how long a user spent playing the game, and possibly what caused the user to stop playing the game. Now, if we were to utilize fixed windows, we may run into uh, problems, because if we are aggregating over a fixed period of time, let's say from like 12 to 1 o'clock, we may have multiple users using the same device and then grouping those users together. Uh, this grouping would not be accurate uh, when performing things like how long did a user uh, spend playing the game, how many of events of a uh, given type uh, did a particular user incur, and so it would give us incorrect correlations over our data. So what we actually want is sessioning. With session windows, we can, we can uh, achieve this per user windowing and do analysis on each of the individual users. In this example, for all elements for a key, in this case a user, denoted by these three different colors, um, are included into, in the window until a period of inactivity. Once that uh, period of inactivity occurs, we then fire off that window and then produce our, uh, uh, calculate statistics over that data. In this case, it gives us exactly the subdivisions that we need. So now looking at our pipeline code, we window into sessions with a gap of five minutes. So we'll capture activity until we don't see any activity for five minutes for a particular user. Then we'll key each individual event by the user ID so that we can uh, do proper groupings on our data. And then we'll group that data together and then perform analysis on that, those groupings of data. So this enables us to do things like uh, answer that question of, how many or how long did a user uh, play the game? It also allows us to do interesting things like take advantage of BigQuery's nested and repeated fields. For instance, grouping together all records for a session into a repeated field and then having an aggregate data record um, uh, sent downstream. So looking at our updated pipeline, we've now added this additional path to perform analysis. You can see now that we're sessioning um, by the user, we're keen by that user before we group that data together. And then finally, we analyze those events before we send them downstream. 
So let's talk a little bit about the state API and the timer API in Beam. Beam lets you process unbounded large amounts of data in a globally distributed scale using the Beam's portability model. And stateful processing along with timers adds a new layer on top of it which enables new use cases and opens up new efficiencies. At its core, Stateful and timely processing happens by augmenting per-element operations. Per-element operations are the things that we talk such as pardos. By adding a mutable state and also adding a timer, like API access. Stateful and time, timely computations are the underlying uh, patterns that, uh, build, that Beam builds up on in other places. Precisely because it is the lower level APIs, it allows you to micromanage your pipelines and your computations to enable new use cases. However, at the same time, it's not magic. By managing state and timers, there, there will be additional complexities that's built into your pipelines. State API works by adding scalability and consistency on top of a finely grained stateful processing. In, this is built on top of Beam's portability. It, it works by allowing setting per key state that's accessible within per-element transforms. With this API, Pardos and any other per-element transforms can access a mutable state that is backed by a data store and can read and mutate this data in a concurrency safe way. And similarly, Timer API allows the stateful do funds to set timers either in the processing time domain or in the event time domain to get callbacks based on some timer event that's customizable by the users. And timer callbacks also have access to the same exact stateful APIs. So let's look at the details of the implementation. So first thing is state is partitioned by key and window. And wh what do we mean by that is, the stateful pardo in the middle of that pipeline has access to a data store. And given an element, the runner will auto-detect the window and the key that's associated with that element. And that stateful pardo will be able to access a state cell within this data store. And why is it important that state is partitioned along the windowing domain in addition to the uh, key domain? Is This allows runners to clean up. Once Windows expires, it's possible for runners to go and clean up the state store this is really important because otherwise the runners will have to keep state forever during the runtime of the pipeline. There are additional constraints that comes with partitioning the state per key and per window. One constraint is since the, there are concurrency guarantees and the partitioning happens per key and per window, that could mean that a runner need to shuffle data to a single worker in order to execute within the context of a per key and per element. So th there are two implications to that. First implication is there could be shuffling. The second implication is that there is a limit to parallelization. It's, it's possible that within the same key and same window, the runner will be forced to execute serially. And the other implication of this comes in the storage and fault tolerance area. Since we are partitioning per key and per window, that means that the state store needs to keep state per key and per window. If there will be a lot of keys and windows, that means that there will be a proportional increase in the storage used. And the corollary of that is, if you want to get a lot of parallelism into your system, you could partition a lot within the key or within the window or in any combination of those two. So let, let's look at an example to clarify a little bit. Here, we are talking about looking at a regular do fun. It takes a key value input and returns some other thing. And the first thing that you will notice is there is a tag used state ID, which uses an identifier index. Here, index is a mutable state cell that is partitioned by key and window. And if you go down a little bit and look at the process element function, in the argument list, you will see the same state ID tag with a matching index identifier. At execution time, runner will pass us the state cell that we can access. And because of the matching, in the matching identifiers, it will be the exact same thing as we defined. 
if you look at the body of the process function, it, it is a three-line function. First thing you should notice is the second line is just a regular Dufan syntax. It is outputting an element based on its inputs. The first line within the method body, it's, it's reading an integer that is stored in the state cell. And the third line is updating this value by writing it on top of it. Since Beam Runners provides the concurrency guarantees, writing into the same state uh, will be guaranteed to not write on top of an undefined values. And another thing I would like to talk about here is the, the type of the state. If you notice, the type of the state, the index, is an integer here. And since I said that, the runners may need to shuffle data across workers. The state value needs to be serializable. In this case, the integer value is serializable, and we are using a variant coder to ensure that. So the important part to get here is whatever you put in your state, it's up to you. However, it needs to have a coder that, it, that, that could serialize the type of your state information. Let's tie this a little bit with the timer API. What does timer API do? Any stateful Dufan could set timers. And timers could be triggered in the processing time or in the event time. So what do we mean by that? Timers could be triggered within the processing time. That means that a stateful Dufan can set a timer that will trigger, let's say, a minute from now. Or a stateful Dufan can set a timer in the event time. And what that could mean is a Dufan could request a timer to trigger when the timestamps of the elements being processed reaches a certain timestamp. Timer events has access to the same state information and have access to the same mutable state data. And in combination, they unlock really powerful scenarios. So this, this is a combined example we are looking at right now. And again, this is a regular Dufan function. It's a stateful Dufan function. You can notice the state ID tags on a bunch of variables. And one thing that is different here is the timer ID tag. We are using timer ID tag to create a new timer. In, in this case, our timer has an identifier called expiry. And the other thing to notice here is timer was created in the event time domain. So that means that we can use this timer to set triggers that will trigger in the event time domain. If you look at our process method, in the argument list, there will be one new argument. That is the timer ID tag with the same exact identifier expiry. Our beam runner will pass us this timer, and it will do the matching based on, based on the matching identifier of expiry. Within the body of the Dufan, it is possible to do any of your regular Dufan logic. After that, before that, or in between that, you can access state APIs and timer APIs. In this case, the Dufan is setting a timer that's going to trigger after the end of the window plus some all-out lateness. And one thing I'd like to point out here is we are setting this timer within the process element function, and this is happening for every element. This is fine because setting and resetting timers in Beam timer APIs is not an expensive operation. Let's go down a little bit to look at our callback method. The method called onExpiry will be our callback method. And beam runners identify this and understand this by the tag onTimer. OnTimer tags tags our callback method. It used by the uh, action of using the same identifier, that's expiry. Beam runner can match this callback event to the timer that we were already using. And within the argument list, of this uh, callback method, you will notice that it actually has access to one of the state in, in the uh, state cells. So this is because timer callbacks have regular access to the state APIs. And to summarize what's happening within this callback method, it is reading some input information from the state, adding some enrichment, and outputting as usual. So in, in combination, this example uses state API, timer API, demonstrate callbacks, and demonstrate use of uh, state and timer tags.
I, I would also like to talk a little bit about the Python SDK within Beam, within the context of the data flow streaming. Python streaming is one of the latest offerings. Python streaming beta was launched in July 2018. From alpha to beta, we made significant improvements in performance and stability, and in terms of the amount of Beam model that is supported. In its current state, Python streaming SDK for Apache Beam supports all of Beam model. It allows reading from Cloud Pops Up. It allows writing to Cloud Pops Up, and it allows writing to Cloud BigQuery. And what is on our roadmap? One thing that's on our roadmap is continuing to improve performance and stability of Python streaming. The next thing is we'll, we are planning to add more and more IOs. That is, adding support for other cloud, Google Cloud data sources, and as well as other open source data sources, such as Apache Kafka. Another feature that is on the roadmap is cross-language transforms. This is one of the most exciting features. Cross-language transforms allow accessing to transforms, or IOs, that are written within other languages. With cross-language transforms, it will be possible to use Python SDK to use any of the IOs that were already developed and has been used for a while within the Java SDK. So this will open up Python SDK users to a large new set of IOs. The next thing we, we have on our roadmap is adding support for all the Cloud Data Flow service features. These are the coolest features that make people use manage Cloud Data Flow service to execute their Beam pipelines. So one of those features is auto-scaling. Auto-scaling all those picking just the right amount of workers automatically for Cloud Data Flow jobs. So this will be one of the features that we are planning to add for Python streaming. And finally, Python tree support. This is a long time requested feature. We are building this into the Python streaming and also for Python batch. And this is one of the, this, is, this concludes one of the major items that's on our roadmap. And I would also like to talk about runners, where you can run Python streaming today. You can run Python streaming SDK on Cloud Dataflow. This is supported at a beta level. You can use the direct runner for local execution. Direct runner is a really cool feature that's a pretty complete runner that can execute Python SDK pipelines within a single computer. It's great for testing and developing new pipelines. And another thing is there, there, there is work going on to enable Python streaming SDK to work on other open source runners. Apache Flink will be one of them. So this will just expand on the synergy of Apache Beam by combining other open source projects together and tying them together. So let's, let's look at how a Python streaming word count example works. The first thing to notice within this example is it is the usual batch word count example with just a few differences. The very first difference is the first line. That is a read, that's an IO operation to read from PopSub. Cloud PopSub is a streaming source, and we are subscribing to a subscription here to read incoming messages as they come along. So this will be a streaming job, and as long as the job is running, it will be reading new messages from Cloud PopSub as it arrives. The other difference that I would like to point out is the second to last line. That is a write operation to Cloud PopSub. Again, Cloud pops up is a streaming pipe, and reading and writing into that requires a streaming job. In this case, once the inputs are processed, we are writing them back into the Cloud pops up in a streaming fashion. Beyond that, there are really no other differences. It is read from an I.O. that is streaming. Do the usual processing, write back to an I.O. that supports streaming. And just a quick highlight for the people who are not very familiar with Python SDK here is, window into is the transform that we use for windowing. That is the same things that we started talking about at the beginning of this presentation. The other interesting thing here is group by key, which respects the windowing as it's defined in the previous window into transform, and groups elements into the, the categories that's based on the key and the window. 
And finally, all the other transforms that are mentioned here, map, pardo, are element-based transforms. These do, they do operation based on a given element, and they produce some number of output elements. And to tie up with the previous segment, Beam Python SDK currently doesn't have support for state and timer APIs, but that's one of the things that's on our feature list that we would like to add as we advance through our roadmap. So with that, we conclude the Python streaming related part. So stay tuned for live Q&A. We'll be back in less than a minute. All right, thank you for the questions. So I'll read the questions from the audience and start answering them. The first question is, what kind of windows do I have? Is it limited, fixed? Is it limited to fixed, sliding, and session windows? In, in Beam, windowing is just an API. It's possible to build any sort of custom windowing functions that satisfies your use case. Beam, by default, comes with these three types of windows, fixed, sliding, and session but there's no limit on how to build or what kind of windows to use. You can look at some of our examples to find how to build your own custom windows. The, the next question is, what are some trade-offs with various triggers? Triggers at its core all of you to customize three things. One, latency. Second, cost. And third, accuracy. Think of a use case where you are trying to show the top 10 users for a mobile game leaderboard. What you probably need is low latency so that your users show new data quickly. Accuracy might not be very important. And you probably want to reduce your costs. And in a different case, let's say this is a billing example that you want to get amount of full billing at the end of a month. In this case, probably latency doesn't matter that much. If you get your data an hour later, the month ends will be OK. But you really want full precision in terms of how your billing comes out. And cost probably doesn't matter that much. So it triggers all of you to customize in these three dimensions. The next question is, where do I go to find more examples? So the Apache Beam SDK on GitHub actually has an examples uh, directory. And within this directory, you can find examples for uh, simple things like word count, all the way up to complex things like running sub-processes within a pardue function. 
We also provide uh, data flow templates. So data flow templates are selectable on the Cloud Council UI within a dropdown. So you can say you're uh, ingesting data from PubSub and you just want to output that to BigQuery. You don't really have that many transformations that you want to do. You just want to get that data into your system. You can go to the data flow Council UI and just select that from a dropdown. But we also publish these templates on GitHub underneath the Google Cloud Platform Dataflow Templates repository. The next question is, what are some other common patterns? Well, we actually have a blog series on common patterns within Cloud Dataflow. You can find these uh, within the Google Cloud Platform blog. Uh, I believe they're called uh, use case and patterns, common use cases and patterns within Cloud Dataflow. Um, in, you know, just to mention some of the other ones that you may find there, uh, should be like uh, dealing with bad data, um, you know, how do I uh, make calls to an external database, um, how do I merge windows together, um, and how do I handle composite keys for like a group by key. So check out those blogs to uh, find out more information about the common patterns within Dataflow. The next question is where is state stored? And Traditionally, in Dataflow, there's an agent that handles storing of state. And how it was implemented initially was it used local disks of the virtual machines. However, with the introduction of streaming engine, some of these things are stored in its own cloud service. So it depends on what you use. It's, it's possible that your local disk is used, or depending on if you are using streaming engine, it will be stored in a, another cloud service. The next question is, when do I use the state API versus another hosted service? So uh, as you can imagine, storing state in the pipeline itself, when do I use that versus storing state in an external store, such as Cloud Bigtable or, um, or, or Redis or memory store? Well, essentially, storing the state within your pipeline allows you to have uh, low latency reads and writes from, from, that, uh, from that state. And it allows you to keep that state only for a particular period of time, so say during your window. So if you're using another hosted service, you may accumulate that state over time and have to do manual cleanup. Another uh, benefit of this is that uh, Dataflow actually manages the state for you. As you saw in the code earlier, all I call is read state or write state. I don't have to worry about setting up any infrastructure. I don't have to worry about managing that infrastructure or monitoring it, because that's all handled on the back end by Google Cloud's Dataflow service. And the last question on the list is, what are the limitations of state API in terms of latency, size, or anything else? The, as we just talked in one of our previous questions, state itself is stored either on local disk or in a different service. So adding a lot of size to your state will mean that a considerable amount of data is moving just because it's part of the state. So if you are in one of these cases, you could consider re-architecting your pipeline such that some of these data is actually part of your main input data. In, in terms of latency, again, the, data, the state needs to be shuffled across workers. So there will be some amount of latency but it will not be a considerable amount. And the final thing that you should be considering is, as we mentioned during our presentation, is that the state data itself needs to be serializable. So as long as you pick a type that is serializable, you can use any type of information for your state. So with that, we wrap up the questions. Stay tuned for the next section, how API products accelerated Walgreens' digital transformation to the cloud. Thank you.